You know the James Bonds of the world? The Ethan Hunts, the Jason Bournes, the characters in the John le Carre and Tom Clancy novels? The ones that secretly save democracy and human life or the world order while the rest of us are just going about our day? Well, that's us now. We're the heroes of this story. We're the ones it's going to come down to. And it's not going to be dependent on us hanging off the side of a helicopter or infiltrating some black tie event or hacking into an incredibly high-tech computer system. The fate of the world depends on us giving enough of a shit about American democracy that we not only save it for our own country, but we shore it up as the leading alternative to the ever-growing autocratic movements gathering steam around the world. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. I'm re-upping a pod I posted last January because the topic couldn't be more pressing. As we approach the midterm elections, people have to understand that the choice isn't between Democrats and Republicans. It's between democracy and autocracy. A society that functions fundamentally on the will of the people, where its elected leaders answer to the citizens, or a society that functions to serve the leaders and the citizens of the country answer to them. This isn't hyperbole or exaggeration. Our country is literally on the brink of becoming unrecognizable. And it's what we do with this information that will make the difference. You know that scene in a movie where the car goes careening off the road and hits the guardrails and spins out and is teetering on the cliff's edge and everyone in the car is just trying to balance so they don't fall into the abyss? Well, that car is America and the cliff is the midterms. If we lean the wrong way right now, we fall into autocracy and we won't be able to stop it. So we need to lean away from the cliff and we need to convince the majority of the country to lean with us. I'm going to say some things today that you might find distressing, things you might be tempted to ignore because they make you feel uncomfortable. I'm going to tell you things that you think can't be possible because it's just not the world you grew up in and you have no frame of reference for the path I'm taking you down. But I need you to understand where we are so you can situate yourself in that reality and we can work together to find our way out. I speak quite a lot about Belarus in this piece, whose issues and corruption remain the same to this day. But eight months later, I also want you thinking about Hungary, Brazil, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and of course, Russia and its hideous invasion of Ukraine. The behavior of these countries is all interconnected. And America, under Republican leadership, would be poised to join this terrifying group of countries whose leaders are looking out for themselves and their power and abandoning any form of democracy, human rights, and the people for a new world order with them at the top. The bottom line is we are in very serious trouble, not just in America, but around the world. And the only way out of it is if enough of us fundamentally come to terms with the problem and care enough to put in the effort to fix it. There are lots of democracies on earth. I don't ever want us to be so arrogant that we think we're the only ones holding the bag. In fact, if we're being honest, I should tell you that the United States has actually fallen off the democracy index, the annual report that tracks and measures the state of democracy in 167 countries. Since 2016, America has actually been downgraded from a full democracy to a flawed democracy. The index is graded using over 60 test points, but the biggest contributors to our lower score are intolerance of COVID-19 restrictions, distrust of the government, bipartisan gridlock, voter suppression tactics, and the increasing polarization between our two major parties. Now, I'm sure we'll drop even lower if the Republicans succeed at suppressing our votes, but even with our score, the 10 most democratic nations in the world cannot fight this growing authoritarian threat without America playing a leading role. America's wealth and military, its industry and influence, still make it the most powerful democratic country in the world, despite our flawed reputation. A leader that has boldly stood against autocracy, fascism, communism, and other forms of destructive government since the beginning. Without America opposing it, I believe this rising tide of autocracy will soon be unstoppable. And if, God forbid, America joins that movement, as Donald Trump and Tucker Carlson and Mike Flynn and Mike Pompeo and Steve Bannon and apparently the entire Republican Party seem inclined to do, the world order as we know it will end. Western democracy will fall and the planet soon after. It's an ugly, terrifying reality and an absolute realistic possibility. Like I said, I don't say this to upset you. I say this to prepare you, to let you know what we're up against 
We don't have the luxury of seeing if time will tell or leaving the decisions up to our leaders. We have to insist on democracy. We have to stand against autocracy and we have to do it now. Ann Applebaum of The Atlantic magazine recently wrote a brilliant article called The Bad Guys Are Winning, How a New Brand of Autocrats Are Outsmarting the West. She explains that we all have in our minds this cartoon image of what an autocratic state looks like. There's a bad man at the top. He controls the police. The police threaten the people. There's evil collaborators and maybe some brave dissidents. But she goes on to say that that's not actually how it works anymore. Autocracies these days are not run by one bad guy, but by a network of bad guys who use their security services, propagandists, and various kleptocratic financial structures kleptocracy being when corrupt leaders use political power to exploit national resources or steal the wealth of their nation for personal need. Think of the PPE money going to Jared Kushner or Steve Mnuchin's friends, or Donald Trump spending over 150 million taxpayer dollars at his own golf courses, or Putin becoming one of the richest people in Russia despite starting out as some low-level KGB agent. The members of these autocratic networks are connected not only within their country, but among other autocratic countries. The corrupt state-controlled companies in one dictatorship do business with the corrupt state-controlled companies in another dictatorship. The police force in one country can arm and equip and train the police force in another country. The propagandist networks share resources like troll farms that will promote multiple dictators' propaganda. And as Applebaum points out, the propagandists also share themes to make sure that the weaknesses of democracy or the evils of America are constantly repeated to anyone who's listening which is often everyone in their country because they usually also control most of the media. Applebaum writes about these new autocrats, the links they share, the impunity they enjoy, the world that they've created that no longer functions on a specific ideology. French philosopher Bernard-Henri Lévy points out that these new group of far-right fascistic types don't even really believe in fascism anymore. He says, look at Marie Le Pen and the rising populace in Europe. They don't care about truth or values or creed. They don't believe in anything. They are pure cynicism, which in itself is the opposite of democracy. For modern day autocrats, it's all about power, personal power, and that's it. In the modern autocratic world, what Applebaum has brilliantly coined Autocracy Inc., Iranian theocrats will work happily alongside Russian nationalists and Chinese communists. It's not about a shared belief or ideology. It's about a common desire for personal and sustained power. Think of Autocracy Inc. not as an ideology, but as a corporation. You've got research and development on these floors, PR on these floors. The CEOs and the executives are working together for the success of the company from their fancy executive suites. There's mergers and acquisitions to bring others into the fold. There are short-term plans and long-term goals and strategy sessions. And if you work for the company, you are a company man who toes the company line. The success of Autocracy Inc. is fundamentally dependent on the destruction of its main competitor, Democracy Inc. And Democracy Inc. is floundering. Every day, the autocrats are getting more and more of a foothold into the market. Sure, they aren't using good business practices. They're heavy into corporate espionage, dirty tricks, infiltration. But they are winning. And this isn't surprising. As I said in last week's pod, democracy took its eye off the ball. And the competition is running with it. Plus, when one team plays by the rules and the other team doesn't, and there's no one there to stop them, the cheater usually wins. Morality, decency, human rights, they're irrelevant to Autocracy Inc. They're in it for the power and the profits and the unfettered success. This is a group of unscrupulous people working together for unscrupulous means. Applebaum points out that for these new autocrats, their countries and definitely their people are secondary if considered at all. This generation of autocrat is focused on money, their own money, and on retaining power at all costs. This is the type of unchecked power Donald Trump and his enablers were looking to establish in America and what the Republican Party is allowing to continue to grow because they've made the calculation that autocracy serves them better than democracy. Democracy has become a burden to their own sustained power and they're supporting the rise of an alternative because they believe, like those in Putin's inner circle, that they will directly benefit from their loyalty and relationship to power when the takeover is complete. And we should take this threat of American autocracy seriously because it's not something we can just undo once it happens. Once autocratic elites are in power, it is almost impossible to remove them because they'll do whatever it takes to stay there, even if that leads to the destruction of their own country, as it already has in places like Venezuela and Syria and perhaps soon Belarus. Russia, the country, isn't doing very well. 
But Putin's power is almost unmatched. The oligarchs that surround him and prop him up are some of the richest people in the world. Modern autocracy is not about the people, the country, or even a better or different way of doing things. It's more self-serving. You get the right leader willing to do whatever it takes for their own benefit, close to the seat of power, and there is a growing amount of people to look to as an example as you take the next step. In Applebaum's article, she uses the example of Belarus, where the current leader and president is a man named Alexander Lukashenko. The last election was held in the summer of 2020, where Lukashenko claimed to have won 80% of the vote, but the people didn't believe him. In fact, what's far more likely is that Lukashenko lost the election to the wife of his jailed political opponent, Svetlana Tikhonovskaya. Tikhonovskaya ran against Lukashenko after the government shut down her husband's campaign and threw him in jail. Lock him up, right? That's how it starts. You get rid of your political opponents by putting them in jail. So Tikhonovskaya picked up her husband's campaign and ran as a wife and a mother and a woman, and Lukashenko allowed her to do it because he didn't see her as a threat. To him, she was some sad little housewife, and letting her run just helped play into the illusion that people still had the opportunity to vote for someone other than him. But Tikhonovskaya's campaign took off. She appealed to the people, her bravery, her strength. She represented her husband's voice where it had been silenced, and women's voices when they had always been silenced. And when two other opposition politicians were blocked from running against Lukashenko, they endorsed her. And suddenly she was the leading alternative and the people rallied around her. Now, this was not an easy campaign. Tikhonovskaya was threatened and intimidated. She ended up sending her children away after they were threatened so that she could keep campaigning without worrying about their safety. On August 9th, 2020, right after the election officials announced that Lukashenko had won 80% of the vote, the internet was shut down. Tikhonovskaya was detained by the police and forced out of the country, so the people who were now demonstrating en masse across the country couldn't rally around her. Now, Belarus is a country of less than 10 million people, but over a million people a day showed up to protest the election results. Day after day, millions of Belarusians would arrive to express their fury. Old people, young people, villagers, factory workers, even some members of the police and armed services reportedly came and removed their badges from their uniforms and publicly threw them out. It was moving and impressive, and you think it would matter. Tikhonovskaya herself said she thought this would be it, that it would be so obvious that the people were furious and wouldn't support this leader, that the people of Belarus were telling the world that they didn't want to live under a dictatorship, and that kind of concerted, sustained effort would eventually cause Lukashenko to back down. She says, we were naive. We thought he would understand that the people were against him, that he lost, and that he should leave. As Applebaum reports, for a while it seemed like Lukashenko himself was confused about what he should do. But that's when Autocracy Inc. took over. Russia flew planes of experts into Belarus to teach Lukashenko what Stephen Began, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State at the time, calls a more sophisticated way to repress his population. To teach Lukashenko what journalist William Dobson has dubbed the dictator's learning curve. Putin sent Russian journalists to replace Belarusian journalists, who immediately started to campaign to discredit the protesters as the work of America and foreign enemies. Russian police were brought in to work with Lukashenko's police and give them advice on how to properly use selective arrests. These are all techniques we're becoming too familiar with here in the States. Undermine your opponent, cheat to win the election, tell people you won the election, refuse to concede the election, flood the press with false stories and blame an outside force, use violence and intimidation to push your agenda, and never, ever back down. It is well known that Vladimir Putin figured out a long time ago that mass arrests are essentially unnecessary. You just have to jail, torture, or possibly murder a few key people, and the rest of your opposition are too frightened into silence. Without any real opposition, eventually the public becomes apathetic because they believe nothing can ever change. Applebaum says that the Lukashenko rescue package that Russia sent was very similar to the one Putin put together for Bashir al-Assad in Syria six years before. It's like a blueprint. Publicly arrest these people. Scare the rest by doing this. The press says that. The police do this. And if you have to use violence against the people, do it. They'll all get back in line. And if you face blowback from the West, Autocracy Inc. is there with a financial package for you to fall back on, like opening the Russian market for what the West is now sanctioning you for in response to your terrible behavior. To be clear, this kind of cooperation between Russia and Belarus wasn't because Lukashenko and Putin were such close friends. In fact, it is apparently quite well known that they do not like each other. But both men shared the same goal, 
A world where the noble West and their democratic values and civil liberties and human rights are no longer the world's superpower. They both seek a new world order where their needs are served and they answer to no one. Both Putin and Lukashenko believe that their personal survival is more important than that of their people or their country. Both believe that a change in their regime would result in their death or imprisonment or exile, and both are hell-bent on that never happening. Applebaum points out that both men also learned that democratic revolutions are contagious. From the Arab Spring, the wave of pro-democracy protests and uprising that took place in the Middle East and North Africa in 2010 and 2011, and the fall of communism in Eastern Europe in 1989 through 1991 that saw the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of 40 years of dictatorial communist rule, the Soviet bloc, and the dissolution of the Soviet Union. They understand that this dream of democracy, of Western values, of freedom and human rights, and the ability to replace bad leaders is such an appealing draw that it is deeply important for Watanabe autocrats to smother emerging democracies in their cribs rather than allow them to grow. Once established, democracies are much harder to kill, which explains why Putin was so enraged by the anti-corruption, pro-democracy demonstrations that led to the overthrow of the Ukrainian government in 2014. After all, if the Ukrainians could get rid of their corrupt dictator, what would stop the Russians from doing the same? It's one of the reasons Putin is so hell-bent on putting the Ukraine back in its place. Not only will it dissuade other countries around him from getting any pro-democracy ideas, but it'll prove to the world stage that America and NATO and the EU no longer have the power they once did, that they are ultimately toothless old superheroes, just sad old men in tights who can no longer fly that no one can really stop him and his allies from taking and doing what they want in this new century. And it's possible that he is not wrong. Belarus is the perfect example of how easy it is for a wannabe strongman to become a real dictator if they have the right mentor and support, and how the West and democracy's influence seems to matter less and less. When Lukashenko's people rose up, he gladly accepted Russia's help. He turned from what Applebaum calls an autocratic patriarchal grandfather type into a tyrant who revels in his own cruelty. Almost overnight, bolstered by Putin's support and his new unfettered power, Lukashenko turned against his people and started trying a whole bunch of new things. Not just selective arrests anymore, but mass arrests. Not just torture, but raping. Not just threatening kidnapping like he did with Tikhonovskaya, but actually kidnapping and then just good old-fashioned straight-up murder. Lukashenko's complete corruption of the rule of law for his own benefit became so glaring, so obvious, so sickening that the world started to take notice. In May 2021, the Belarusian Air Force forced an Irish-owned passenger plane to land in their capital so that the government could arrest one of the passengers, a young man and prominent opposition journalist who had documented in great detail the numerous public beatings and arrests by Lukashenko's security forces, and it amplified the voices of the national protests against the Lukashenko government. The KGB had already branded this journalist as a terrorist and accused him of organizing mass riots. He was living in exile, but he was obviously being tracked, and he is now a political prisoner in Belarus. If he is charged with terrorism, he faces life in prison or the death penalty. All for reporting the truth. So when an American politician calls the media the enemy, and any time the free press is abused or beaten or thrown out of the room so something can happen in secret, know this is the path we are going down and put the brakes on. In August, another young man living in the Ukraine who headed up a group to help people flee from Belarus and the brutality of the Lukashenko government was found hung in a park after going for a jog. So when you hear people like Marjorie Taylor Greene say we should be using the Second Amendment against Democrats, know this is the road they're taking us down and put the brakes on. At around the same time, Lukashenko started to destabilize his EU neighbors by forcing streams of refugees to cross into their countries against their will. The Lukashenko government was tricking Afghan and Iraqi refugees to come to Belarus with the offer of long-term visas and then taking them to the borders of Lithuania and Latvia and Poland by gunpoint and forcing them to cross illegally. This caused a real crisis for these border countries and they were using human beings as weapons of war. So when our government separates people from their children and puts them in cages and forces hysterectomies on them, know this is the road they are traveling and put the brakes on. Lukashenko's behaviors broke not only the laws and customs of his own country, but also the laws and customs of other countries. 
You'd think no one could be so brazen, but there is a dangerous pattern emerging where authoritarians do whatever it takes to silence the voices of their opposition and suppress dissent in their countries, and no one does anything about it. The Atlantic's Anne Applebaum says she started to really look into Autocracy Inc. because she wanted to understand why today's dictators were able to get away with so much. Not just inside their own borders, but abroad in the Western democratic world. Lukashenko hijacked a plane, flying in international airspace from Greece to Lithuania with no repercussions. The Russians have murdered people in the UK and Germany, and no one was held accountable. The Saudi crown prince literally had an American journalist murdered, dismembered, and flown in pieces out of Turkey, and we did nothing in response. Peng Shui, the Chinese tennis star, was literally disappeared both physically and from the internet after she went public about being sexually assaulted by a top Chinese official. And the best the West could do between that and the concentration camps that the Chinese Uyghurs live in was to formally announce we would not be sending emissaries to the Chinese Olympic Games. I understand we have problems at home, but as Tatiana Margolin, writer for Al Jazeera, says, it was basically the world's equivalent of saying thoughts and prayers. Just blanket nothingness that accomplishes nothing but leaves the path open for the bad things to keep happening. These men, these new autocratic leaders, are basically told every day that they can keep doing what they're doing and pay no price. It's a lot like the Republican leaders in the U.S. They keep doing things that are so clearly dishonest and illegal and we say, hey, that's not okay. And yet it feels like uh, maybe it is because there's just no accountability. And without accountability, the only lesson you learn is do it again, do it bigger, get more. Who's going to stop you? All of our old diplomatic tools, sanctions, human rights investigations, public shunning, now seem weak and ineffective against these new autocrats. Sort of a laughable throwback to a different age when people cared what you thought about them. Applebaum says one of our biggest problems is that we keep reacting to each new outrage as if they were separate events, rather than recognizing they're actually part of a far bigger picture that's coming together. One where these authoritarian leaders are actually in charge, and we answer to them. As Applebaum points out, in theory, Belarus should be an international pariah. Its planes can't land in Europe. Belarusian goods can't be sold in the U.S. Its brutality has been criticized by all the international institutions. But in practice, the country remains a high-ranking member of Autocracy Inc., so it's doing just fine. Despite Lukashenko's middle finger to human rights and international norms, despite his breaking laws in his own and other countries, Belarus remains the location of one of China's largest overseas development projects. Iran continues to expand its relationship with the country. Cuban officials have expressed their solidarity with the leader at the UN and publicly called for an end to foreign interference in the country's affairs. Applebaum draws the line between Belarus and Venezuela, where Nicolas Maduro should also theoretically be an international pariah. U.S. citizens and companies have been forbidden from doing business there. Canada, the EU, and many of Venezuelan South American neighbors have sanctions against the country. And yet, Maduro is flush with loans and oil investments from Russia and China. Turkey facilitates an illicit Venezuelan gold trade. Cuba provides high-ranking Venezuelan officials with security advisors and technology. And they have a booming drug trade, if you know the right people. Applebaum points out that though Maduro's opponents have received some foreign assistance from Western democracies, it is nowhere near the kind of money and support Maduro is receiving from Autocracy Inc. Just like in Belarus, Venezuela has opposition leaders that people want to rally around, and dedicated grassroots activists trying to oppose the ever-growing power of the autocracy. And these counter-pressures should be effective. Leaders like Tikhonovskaya, who are able to persuade millions of people to get out and protest, might actually work if their country's corrupt regimes were the ones they were actually fighting against. But as Applebaum notes, these protesters and opposition forces are actually fighting multiple autocrats in multiple countries, all who have each other's backs. There is a new world order growing every day, and those who would fight back like the pro-democracy Hong Kong movement, the Cuban, Iranian, and Burmese people who are out there every day pushing for democracy, even those of us at home fighting against the corrupt GOP, pointing out their lies and their plans and their criminal cynicism, are all fighting an uphill battle. We're fighting against billionaires, against people who control state companies and have access to billions of dollars of investments that they are using for purely political reasons. We are up against people buying sophisticated surveillance technologies from China and bots from Russia and just endless, endless propaganda pumped into our societies. 
Above all, we are fighting leaders who no longer care about the feelings or opinions of others or the success or even failure of the country they theoretically want to lead. Applebaum points out that the Soviet Union was an incredibly powerful autocracy, but it also cared deeply about how it was perceived in the world. It tried to persuade people that their political system was better than Western democracies, and they fought back when they were criticized by Western nations. The old Soviet Union believed in what they were doing, but the leaders of Autocracy Inc. are different. They couldn't care less what people say about them. Most of them don't have an ideology beyond nationalism, self-enrichment, and their own desire to remain in power. They stand for nothing, so they'll throw anything, even their own people, under the bus to stay on top. So this idea of Western values of human rights groups and international institutions looking down on them just doesn't hold any power. It just doesn't matter. Russia even moved beyond ignoring foreign criticism to outrightly mocking it. Putin held elections last year in which 9 million people were barred from even running against him. His government got five times more television coverage than all the other parties combined. People got multiple videos of government officials stealing votes. Vote counts were mysteriously changed. And Putin literally has his main rival starving to death in jail as we speak. And yet when he won, Donald Trump, the president of the United States of America, called to congratulate him on such a great win. It's like the world is impotent or unwilling to stop him. And just like any bully who isn't stopped, you only get more powerful. Putin surrounds himself with yes men, people who are scared of him and people who owe him favors. And that is both on a personal and geopolitical level. And this isn't just a Russia thing. We just watched Hong Kong's democracy be destroyed in real time with zero shame for the Chinese government for going back on their word to keep Hong Kong independent. The Burmese government just unabashedly murdered hundreds of protesters, including young teenagers in the street, for daring to publicly oppose them. According to human rights activist, Lukashenko currently has more than 800 political prisoners in jail in Belarus for daring to speak out against him. These new leaders don't care what people think about them. They aren't here to make friends. They're here to win. It's Survivor, World Domination Edition. And being a member of Autocracy Inc. has privileges. Not just money and security, but also impunity. They answer to no one. Their power grows as their numbers do. They're all working together. They're cooperating with a single goal in mind. Their own continued success and power. Yashi Monk, senior fellow at New America, points out that throughout the history of Western democracy, it has been a Western democratic country that has been the strongest country in the world. First, it was Great Britain, and then it was America. But it's not clear that that will continue to be the case in the next 20 to 40 years. Democracy has a lot of forces pushing against it, both internationally and here at home. This isn't speculation. This isn't a long shot. The similarities between today's Republican Party and the far-right regimes around the world are terrifying. We need to keep pointing it out to our friends and family, insisted it be pointed out by our media. This isn't rhetoric. The Republicans are abandoning American democracy while distracting the public by projecting their behavior onto the left. They want in to Autocracy Inc. They favor total control, a white evangelical patriarchy with authoritarian rule. They make it more clear every day that they are not interested in democracy with a diverse demographic. Michael Flynn, retired lieutenant general and former national security advisor, calls for one religion. Congress members like Marjorie Taylor Greene talk about punishing private companies that don't bow to the GOP will. Republican Governor Kristi Noom just introduced two new education bills, one that says students will not be taught to actively protest, and the second is that our children should be taught a true and honest history of the U.S. Republican Governor of Florida Ron DeSantis said that teachers should be monitored to make sure they aren't smuggling inappropriate content like leftist ideologies into the classrooms. Texas and Virginia's Republican governors are removing inappropriate books from libraries and schools. Inappropriate books like Toni Morrison's Pulitzer Prize winning Beloved. This is not American behavior. This is authoritarian behavior. And it fits right into Autocracy Inc. Look at how China treats the Uyghurs the minority Muslim population in their country. People are disappeared. Families are separated. People are sent to prison re-education camps to be reprogrammed. In fact, as of 2020, there are said to be over 1.8 million people in these camps. Chinese officials block family members from communicating online. They black out people's profiles and throw people in camps for even communicating with someone who might have been deemed to have anti-Chinese sentiments. Which is why when we talk about who's a real patriot and who's a real American should feel deeply alarming. The people pushing this rhetoric are the people with a real chance of cheating their way to power. 
To think they won't do these things once they're there feels willfully naive. Marjorie Taylor Greene just talked about using the Second Amendment on Democrats. Turning Point USA had a supporter ask its leader, when do we get to start shooting these people? The official spokesperson for Ron DeSantis just wrote on Twitter, it's not enough to just win the elections in 2022. Nothing short of humiliating defeat will stop the lockdown libs. Make them laughing stocks. Make them ashamed to show their face in public. And then in all caps, make them pay for what they've done. Now I know I'm not alone in being unable to continue to watch the HBO version of Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale because it felt entirely too plausible. There's a scene in one of the first couple of episodes before it's all gone to hell where women in our modern Western society lose access to their bank accounts so the men in their lives can now manage their money. The main character's husband is like, don't worry about it, I'll take care of you. And she's like, that's not the point. Later in the episode, a decree comes down that women are no longer allowed to hold jobs and the men just kind of stand around in disbelief as the women in their offices pack up their stuff and are escorted out. The vibe isn't outrage. The vibe is confusion. Like, this is weird. And when the protests around these shocking actions take to the street, something that all of us would think to do to express our fury at a decision like that, to exercise our First Amendment rights, something we are so used to doing here, like I have done so many times myself, to honor my protected First Amendment right to assemble, I found it almost unbearable to watch the police open fire on the protesters. The show films it almost as if the first shot was fired by mistake. But then once it was a possibility, all hell breaks loose and all the police start firing. The shock on the faces of the American protesters is all too close to what I imagine my own face would look like in such a position. Just how can this be happening? How can this be real? But then I watched Trump smoke bomb peaceful protesters for a photo op with an active military general walking beside him. I saw the government use Black Hawk helicopters to wrangle BLM. I saw unnamed armed militia units standing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, but then no actual military presence when armed rioters attacked and sacked the Capitol. And you can't see all that and not think something is wrong here. Something is deeply, deeply wrong. The world is changing and the allure of autocracy is growing in power every day. In 2009, the Turkish Prime Minister, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, called the Chinese repression of the Uyghurs a genocide. In 2012, he promised to invest in the Uyghur businesses and help support them because it was popular with his people and with human rights groups around the world. But since then, Erdogan, who became president in 2014, has turned against the rule of law, against independent media, against independent courts, and has become openly hostile to former European and NATO allies. He is arresting and jailing anyone who speaks out against him and has done a complete 180 on his relationship with China, including completely embracing and echoing Chinese propaganda. Now, instead of supporting the Uyghurs as they try to escape into his country or live with family members within his borders, he's having them rounded up and detained. He's calling them terrorists and deporting them to the very camps he once blamed for genocide. The Turkish media, politics, business, and police are now all pro-Chinese, anti-Uyghur, anti-Western. Erdogan clearly got the Autocracy Inc. memo. And even though the Uyghurs in Turkey are still protected by what remains of democracy in that country, the balance is way off. Pakistan has stated that they will accept the Chinese version of what is happening with the Uyghurs. The Saudis, Emirates, and Egyptians have all arrested, detained, and deported Uyghurs without discussion at China's request. Because you can't move up the ladder or be a member in good standing with Autocracy Inc. without good economic relations with China. As Applebaum says, for autocrats and would-be autocrats around the world, the Chinese offer looks a little like this. Agree to follow China's lead on Hong Kong, Tibet, Taiwan, the Uyghurs, and human rights. Buy Chinese surveillance equipment. Accept massive Chinese investment, preferably into companies you personally control or at least that pay you kickbacks. And then sit back and relax, knowing that however bad your image becomes in the eyes of the international human rights community, you and your friends will remain in power. And really, how different is that than what's happening here in the States? Russia is already manipulating our political conversations using social media, fake websites, funding for extremist parties, hacking private communications of our major political parties, and has clearly made major inroads with the Republicans. The Chinese have infiltrated our higher education at American universities to shape academic debate into China's favor. They've broken into pro-Chinese democracy offices in D.C. and Maryland, approached activists in the U.S. to persuade them to return to China, while others have had strange accidents. But the Chinese influence is even more subversive than that. 
China is currently bankrolling a majority of major Hollywood productions. So they've been able to change what we make, what we say about them, what goes into the movies, and what ideologies are promoted. They created TikTok, which I can tell you from personal experience does not want us understanding each other, but fighting. It's what they promote, hate and division among American citizens. But because of their population, their technological advances, and the market they offer, to get their money, you have to play by their rules. And their rules and democracy do not go hand in hand. In 2019, after the general manager of the Houston Rockets tweeted his support for the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong, the NBA commissioner, along with a bunch of NBA stars, publicly apologized to China so they wouldn't lose money in the Chinese market. For those of us who believe in the power of America to support democratic values and human rights around the world, this behavior was the grossest type of pandering and very alarming that such a powerful company from such a democratic stronghold would kowtow like that. But this behavior is everywhere. In many ways, America is less democratic than it is capitalistic. So money seems to come before ideology. And if your motivation is financial, you'll do anything for the big money deal. And China, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and other non-democratic countries with oligarchs all offer the big money deal. American pop stars and movie stars get paid millions to perform for and party with some of the worst abusers of human rights in the world. But provided you don't criticize them, the money and opportunities just keep rolling in. Autocracy Inc. seems pretty confident that the Western world's desire for money and power will safely let them continue abusing human rights provided the right people are making a profit. Democratic countries should be helping democratic movements around the world, but the list of major corporations caught up in personal financial and business dealings with China, Russia, and other autocracies is distressingly long. During the heavily manipulated and deliberately confusing Russian elections in September 2021, both Apple and Google removed apps that had been specifically designed to help Russian voters decide which opposition candidate to select, after Russian authorities threatened to persecute the company's local employees. The apps have been created by Putin's nemesis Alexei Navalny's anti-corruption movement, the most viable opposition movement in the country, which itself was not allowed to participate in the election. And Navalny, who remains in prison on ludicrous charges, rightly called out the corporate moguls for being liars and hypocrites who claim to want to make the world a better place, but will bow to the worst of the world for their own profits. If the 20th century was the story of a slow struggle that ended in the victory of liberal democracy over the other ideologies like communism, fascism, extreme nationalism, then the 21st century, if we don't take it seriously, might be just the opposite. The Stanford scholar Larry Diamond says this era is one of democratic regression, and pro-democracy activists all around the world agree that the diplomatic toolbox is deeply out of date. Tactics that used to work against these growing autocracies, like sanctions and public perception, no longer have the same impact. And they can often seem, as Stephen Began, the former Deputy Secretary of State, puts it, like an exercise in self-gratification, where we sternly condemn someone or something and then we just move on. Like, the vice president won't be at the Olympics, so there. But it's just not good enough. We need to support democracy, at home and abroad. Republicans don't want Americans to vote. They flood our airways with lies and propaganda. They want to put a very obviously corrupt strongman who already tried to stay in power despite losing the election in power again. And should something happen to him, they have an entire bench of seemingly unscrupulous people waiting to take the crown. We cannot pretend that the autocracy that is rising around the world, that is funded and protected by the leaders of Autocracy Inc., like Russia and China and Saudi Arabia, aren't all in for supporting the end of American democracy that it wouldn't serve them to take their biggest adversary off the board by simply supporting those who seek to destroy us from within. Remember, Donald Trump Jr. told a business conference in 2008 that Russians make up a pretty disproportionate cross-section of our assets. And in 2016, it appears that that long-term investment in the Trump business empire paid off. In the Trump family, Putin has what Applebaum smartly points out as something better than spies. Cynical, nihilistic, indebted, long-term allies who only have their best interest in mind. Perfect candidates for Autocracy Inc. Donald Trump is doing this for ego and money. His party is doing it for power and control. This is not about the country. It's not about policy. It's certainly not about conservatism. It's Italy under Mussolini and Spain under Pinochet and Germany under Hitler. It's what Putin has done to Russia and what Erdogan has done to Turkey and Lukashenko is doing in Belarus. These autocrats are not going away. They're waiting for the West to be weak enough to take over, and they have waited a long time for this. 
And if America, the biggest power that could ever stand against them, sets themselves up with their own dictator, then who will be left to stand against them? America needs to be a democratic country. Say what you will about our flaws, and there are many, but the world uses America as a lighthouse in the dark, as an inspiration to the world, and an alternative to those who rule for their own best interests. We have to fix what's happening at home and then turn our eye to shoring up democracy around the world. As Applebaum says, the only meaningful response to a network of autocracies will be from a network of democracies. But we clearly have a lot of work ahead of us before we can create one that's up to the challenge. The values or lack thereof of the autocratic world are corroding the democratic world like a fire hose on a sandcastle. We have something beautiful, but they're destroying it right in front of our eyes. And what are we doing to stop it? We have to come out in such force and numbers that even if we can't pass a single voter protection, they won't be able to gerrymander us into silence or suppress our voices or undermine our vote. We have to register new voters and take responsibility for our people. One third of the country doesn't vote. No one has accounted for them. We have to. We have to get everyone we know to vote, to get them registered, to drive them to the polls. We have no choice but to keep the House and expand the Senate. And once we do that, we ignore those who would hold us back for their own selfish means. And we pass sweeping voter protections and bills to shore up our democracy. We show the world how a real democracy is fucking done. We pass truth in broadcasting laws and take the lies out of the equation. We pass corporate finance laws and better insider trading laws and maybe even laws to publicly fund elections so that every Everyone has the same amount of money and has to run on their policies and not their billionaire backers plans. We balance the courts so we are no longer ruled by a corrupt, bought and paid for far right mockery of our justice system. And we pass popular legislation to help the people like paid family leave and higher minimum wage and Medicare for all to prove that real democracy can actually work to help the people. We become what we've always said we were, a shining city on a hill and autocracy Inc.'s biggest nightmare. Democracy is contagious, and we need the hope of it to spread everywhere. We must protect and support it every time it raises its head. We send money to pro-democratic movements. We have countries like the Ukraine's back. We support the dissidents in Belarus and Turkey and Venezuela. We make it hurt if you cut up one of our journalists. We make it hurt if you have concentration camps or support genocide. We have a gigantic military budget. We need to make less drones and use some of it to support democracies worldwide. We support people like the Kurds. We don't fuck them over. We don't abandon our allies in Afghanistan. We change our foreign policy so it supports not just American influence, but democratic influence around the world. We offer a real alternative to what is rising, not just in America, but beyond. And we make sure that the strongest country in the world remains a democratic country. But this only happens if every single one of you stays engaged. Send money if you have it to people like Mark Elias and his democracy docket to fight the voter suppression that's happening all over the country. Send postcards and run voting drives and get people signed up to vote. You run for local office, especially school boards and local and state election boards. You support the pro-democratic candidates that can turn the tide of Congress, like Tim Ryan in Ohio and Val Demings in Florida. You make sure Mark Kelly and Raphael Warnock keep their Senate seats. And you support all Democratic House candidates, legislative candidates, and you push hard for Democratic governors who have the power to protect our elections and our people. You stand up for democracy. You stand up for America. You stand up to your relatives who don't know what the fuck they're talking about and you make them understand what's at stake. Yes, it'll be uncomfortable, but no more uncomfortable than living in an autocratic country run by Trump and his enablers. No more frustrating than Steve Bannon walking free and Stacey Abrams in jail. The fascist forces of the world are on the rise. Only with awareness and courage can we push back. We have to be better than autocracy or we will be defeated by them. We can't just let Autocracy Inc. and their bad men take over. The media is doing our country an incredible disservice by pretending this isn't happening, but it is. And we need to face it if we're going to beat it. You. You are the hero of democracy. You are Ethan Hunt. You are James Bond. The autocratic wave stops here. Be the break wall. Build it high and strong. Piece by piece. Call by call, conversation by conversation. Be the defense that they smash against and fail, not once, but over and over again. We can win this war. And make no mistake, it is a war. But we have to come out in numbers they won't believe and stand up for democracy in a way they thought we'd forgotten. We are the descendants of the men who stormed the beach at Normandy, the boys in the trenches, the soldiers who liberated Auschwitz. We are Americans and we will not fall to Democracy Inc. It is not in our DNA. So that's it. 
Send money to candidates. Have talks with your friends about the importance of voting for the Democrats, the only party who believe in actual democracy, and steal yourself for the battle ahead. These people are out to take it all from us and call it patriotism. We need to remind them what a real patriot is. I want to thank Anne for her incredible journalism and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Now make a plan to vote in the midterms. Until next week, PG out. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.